Okay, it's just five o'clock now. You're all very welcome to this uh, See and Learn webinar. You're all very good to join me on this gorgeous afternoon. I'm based down here in Tipperary and the sun is splitting the stone. So thanks again for coming on this lovely evening. Um, we're going to fly through this uh, webinar um, and we are going to look at how I can give you some ideas of how to promote vocabulary, um, improve language expansion using this resource, the See and Learn resource. This resource has been around for a particularly long time. Um, it has been used by speech and language therapists in the UK um, for many years. It also has pathways in the UK where speech and language therapists will um, bring children in and they will work on um, promotion of vocabulary on this pathway. Uh, we have had in the past few months, a lot of engagement from the CDNTs, the Children with Disability Network teams, who have been interested in supporting children with Down syndrome in their clinics, and they have um, been interested in this resource. I call This is a resource, it is not a specific program, but it is a resource that is evidence-based and one that I have used as a number of years as a speech and language therapist. My name is Olive Buckridge. I'm the special, I'm the early years support specialist in Down Syndrome Ireland. I'm also a speech and language therapist, and I come at everything with this dual approach. I'm looking at supporting a lot of the aspects of being a zero to six year old with Down Syndrome. It could be medical, it could be educational, it could be emotional, and providing those supports for families also. Um, in terms of my knowledge of uh, speech and language therapy. I've been qualified now over 23 years um, and I've been working with children with Down syndrome for a third of my clinical practice. Um, this is an area that I find very rewarding. I love interacting with preschool teachers, early years educators, primary school teachers, other SLTs um, and parents, obviously parents. And of course, the big one, working with the children themselves. They're absolutely amazing. And that makes the job very, very rewarding. So let's start with the see and learn. You can see from the cover sheet there that um, very simple resources, there are paper-based resources, or you can use them on an iPad, um, depending on what your child is interested in or where they are developmentally with their fine motor control. Um, do they find it difficult to grasp? I'm, I'm so traditional in my approach to everything. I do like the paper-based or the cardboard-based, whatever resources that we use. I like the fact that they're that they are the child can hold them, um, they can look at them for prolonged periods as well. That said, the iPad, a lot of parents find it a lot easier to use an iPad or in school, it's a much easier um, way of presenting the information also. Um, again, for those who are just jumping on there, welcome. This is um a very um general overview of the see and learn resource. So let's start. Okay, so why are we using the see and learn? Why is it that I am here doing this webinar tonight? It's to really help promote speech and language in the across the lifespan. And this can be used at any juncture across the lifespan. So even though I work in the preschool and junior infant cycle. Um, this can be introduced at any particular time, depending on the child's needs. Now, there are some children who will be using full sentences, can explain themselves brilliantly. This may not be the resource for them. This is for children who are building up on their vocabulary or students who need extra support in building their vocabulary. They may not have enough vocabulary to put two to three word sentences to get together. If this is the case, then this resource is for you. There will be other uh, programs there for children who need support with literacy. The reading language intervention is one of those. I would advise you to go to the Down Syndrome Education International website. Um, and there are a number of tutorial videos about reading and reading language intervention there. But if your child or the student you're working with has a limited expressive language, so they have a limited number of nouns or verbs that they're using in their everyday vocabulary, then this is something that can support them. We need speech and we need language. We need to communicate our wants and needs effectively. We need language to have relationships, to protest, to request, to um, negotiate, to tell somebody that you are fond of them, all of those kind of things. We need language for everyday interactions. 
particularly for children in primary school. They need them for relationships, their friends, their siblings, um, and extended family members. We need language as well, so we can build and expand our sentences and to create narratives and all of those lovely things um, that help shape our communication. When we're working with children or students with Down syndrome, there are areas that need to be developed. Um, we come from a, a completely positive um, viewpoint here. There are no weaknesses, it's just areas to be developed. And one of those areas is obviously speech and language. This is one of the areas that is affected by um, by Down syndrome, uh, by the genetic uh, makeup of the syndrome. And it is dependent on the child, the level of um, difficulty they will have. They may have mild issues. They may have more complex issues. It just depends on the child. The other area that is so important to consider is working memory. Now, working memory is the ability to hold information when we hear it in our in our heads and then to be able to process that information and to um, find that information and then produce it. So it would be like me giving you a string of numbers, two, seven, five, nine, six, four, and giving about 10 seconds break and then asking you to tell me those numbers back. On average, we should be able to retain six to seven numbers and produce them again. Um, for children with Down syndrome, this is quite difficult. Working memory can be impacted um, and a number of the assessments that children have going into school or going on to post-primary um, will have areas that highlight working memory deficits. And this can have implications for learning. We need to repeat things over and over in order for these things to consolidate. Sometimes teachers or parents will say, we've worked and worked on something for a block of therapy or for a period of time. And when we came back after a break, it seemed that the child had forgotten it. The point is we need to keep at things. We need to keep working, 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 constant, constant. And that's why um, a new document that speech and language therapists in um, who work in the UK and work with children with Down syndrome have put this document together to show that consistent intervention, weekly intervention is essential because working memory is a factor. Concentration is also an issue because we forget that children with Down syndrome can find it difficult to maintain upright posture, sit in position for long, prolonged periods of time. We're talking at them, they're trying to sit, they're trying to concentrate, and we are asking a lot of them. We need to make sure that they're able to concentrate, but all the other areas are taken care of, like their good seating position, they're not tilting forward or tilting to the side, or drawing their legs upwards to them. These are, in fact, ways of identifying when they aren't concentrating because they're trying to keep their body in a position. Finding gross motor skills, um, we know that it can be difficult for the pincer group to develop. Um, and so when we're offering cards, we have to be mindful that we're not putting things very far away from the child. Um, looking at their ability to stride well, hop, run, all of those things um, are important as well. Vision and hearing. I could take up the whole hour of this webinar talking to you about the impact of vision and hearing. Vision is affected um, well, it affects, excuse me, affects about 70% of children with Down syndrome where they can have difficulty focusing on fonts and on um, the written word. Uh, and it can be quite difficult for them then if they don't have the appropriate um, or the, the correct prescriptions that they might have difficulty focusing. You will hear Dr. Fadama Brady, who is the head of education here in Down Syndrome Ireland, talking about the need to have fonts about 18 font size, uh, writing with marker on the page so the child can really see the word. Hearing, this is so impactful. If your child has a history or the student has a history of hearing impairment, especially middle ear impairment, it is really important to find out what level of hearing um, deficit or hearing issues the child has and how it impacts speech. Sometimes you can have a hearing problem and it doesn't affect our ability to hear speech. However, more often than not, particularly children with Down syndrome under the ages of six in particular, um, can have fluctuating hearing loss and this can impact their ability to acquire speech sounds and how they hear the sounds and how they reproduce the sounds. So if you are attending an audiologist, ask them 
to plot the audiogram onto a speech banana. And this is very helpful for speech and language therapists because then they know what sounds are really, really impacted. Also seek advice from the audiologist um, if you have middle ear infections or congestive or that conductive hearing loss or with due to congestion or whatever it may be. Um, and seek out something to support the child during these periodic um, conductive hearing loss um, times. It's really important to look at things like Baja bands or hearing aids um, because they can really help. But what we can do is as educators, parents, um, therapists, whomever you, you are who is on tonight uh, working with a child with Down syndrome, we need to know our learning profile. We need to know that the learning profile of a child with Down syndrome is a gift because if we understand it, we can tailor our teaching, we can tailor our therapy, um, our everyday interactions around that. And knowing that a child with Down syndrome has strong visual awareness needs to be acknowledged and it needs to be supported. We need to use our hands for signing. We need to focus on our mouths, get them to look at our mouths. We need them to watch more um, of the visual cues that we can give them, be they paper-based, um, high-tech, low-tech, whatever it may be. Um, and we're using gestures, symbols, anything to support learning and understanding. We know from the literature as well that children from about two and a half can actually identify a word as a word. This, for me, is like gold dust. Imagine being able to recognize the representation of a word. This is something um, that typically developing peers, we don't look at, we don't promote, we don't um, acknowledge. But with children with Down syndrome, this is this is fantastic. I don't know if a lot of their typically, typically developing peers have this skill, that they can look at a written word and after a couple of seconds, match that to, an, to a similar word and then go on and select between words identify those words it's amazing and we really need to work on supporting this tendency to copy and model behaviors that's why we've got some great signers out there or children that can really copy gesture facial expressions we need to exploit this skill because we know they're really good at imitation we can work on um getting them to imitate speech sounds um the way we're mouthing um sounds so it's really really important Learning from practical materials like the See and Learn, like Nuffield, like any of the other intervention programs that we use, it is really, really important. Having children that are very keen to, to socialize and communicate is another gift because you will always get something back. You will, you will find that the children want to communicate with you, want to tell you information, are very good to carry um, out instructions for you as well. So you're working with children that are visual, that are, uh, you know, really strong and sight words, want to copy and model, uh, want to copy your signs, want to copy what you're doing with your facial expressions, and they want to communicate. They need a lot of support learning with visual supports. If you take nothing away from tonight, visual supports, your hands are your visual supports, this is a visual support as well. Um, and so when we can take that learning profile and constantly refer to it, if you're a teacher or if you're an early years educator, if you're working in the post-primary field, that you take this learning profile, you really commit it to memory and you, and, and you use it as a, as a guideline um, for creating your plans, your sessions, whatever it is you're doing. Looking at speech development, we start from about six months, which is in line with the current research. Um, we should be intervening in the first year of life. We should be supporting children in the first year of life as they acquire their speech and language. It is extremely important if you are a therapist that you become aware of the, uh, the guidelines, the guidance that is out there that is based in the UK and uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, that we are starting to intervene much earlier with children um, and from about six months, really from birth, you can do an awful lot of work. But six months is the time I start speech intervention with children. We know that speech development can be tricky because of anatomical differences. One of the anatomical differences is that children can, uh, with Down syndrome can have a smaller oral cavity and a higher cleft. So it can be difficult to make those speech sounds um, clear and intelligible. We, again, I talked about the um, prevalence of conductive hearing loss, um, and that has been recognized by the WHO, who have put children in the zero to six category at an at-risk 
category because of the high incidence of conductive hearing loss due to otitis media. Again, we've talked about working memory, trying to remember a speech sound can be very hard if it's presented um, to the auditory process alone. You need to support that with cute articulation or prompt, whatever it is the speech and language therapist is doing. We want children to have good spoken language. If you have good hearing, you'll have good speech. If you have good intervention, early intervention, you will have those supports in place also that can help with um, speech. I'm drawing your attention to here to this banner with the ages of acquisition for a particular sounds. You see by the age of two, children with Down syndrome should be producing papa de wa. And then uh, three, they have a lot of those more difficult um, phonemes. They've acquired them. And you see there, um, they have blends, some blends by about three. And then at four, they have um, affricates, um, such as ch. So they're a j. Um, they are harder sounds to acquire. And at the, developmentally, they acquire them at that age. So if you're working with children with Down syndrome, be very aware of that um, developmental acquisition. How we work with children very on, we start imitating their productions, their coups, their sounds. And if you start early on by imitation, the children just build up that skill of learning to imitate you as you imitate them. It's quite a nice, respectful um, uh, turn taking and it develops a lovely relationship as you go forward. And I have the joy of so many babies, um, baby groups that I love doing that and I love the outcome of it as well. It's wonderful. We need to really target um, auditory discrimination early on. Can the child hear the difference between ba and da, m and ta? All of that because um, this will really help when they go to produce the words as well. And again, we can get sound discrimination at nine months. So it's amazing. And if you're a parent here who's seen it being done, please put a hands up to say you've seen it. <laughs> How do we support speech development? We really from early, thank you so much. I appreciate it, Bob. Thank you, Sandra. Um, so if we see um, our babies early on, we work on their smiling, babbling and, and general engagement. And then we work on lip movement, singing, signing, all of that to get them engaging. And then from about two onwards, we help um, with sound awareness and producing the sound. We use signs and gestures. We use cute articulation and not feel. So cute articulation is a very specific signing system for sounds and words, or sounds and vowels, sorry. The not field is used for children who may present with apraxia. Some therapists will use that, but we will use it also for sequencing of sounds. And we use our cute articulation there. You see it, the speech signing. I'll send on that resource to you with the copy of this um, uh, PowerPoint also this evening. So in this presentation, you will find links to cute articulation. There's a song which can be great to play if you're in primary school. Um, and if you're trying to learn it as a, a professional, it's a great way to learn the, the, the signs. But one uh, that I would recommend is there uh, the second link, which is Sign with Steve. It's a really easy uh, way to learn how to sign um, the sounds using cute articulation. And it's easy to watch. Um, so I'd highly recommend that. So why are we, again, we, we, we can see that children with uh, Down syndrome are presenting sometimes with delays in speech and language. Again, the degree of delay is, is affected by environmental factors, but it is also affected um, by the genetic component. Like uh, we cannot determine the level of difficulty the child will have. We can we can look at how they're presenting with their babble. If they have loads of babble, it's a great predictor of speech. But as they're developing their communication um, system, we can see um, how much of an impact um, their, their language difficulties are having. But we know, what we do know is that children with Down syndrome or adults with Down syndrome have um, really good functional communication, really good, strong understanding. Um, and of everyday communication, they, they follow along, they can literally do whatever their typically developing peers are doing, they're following along. We know that um, vocabulary is delayed, but it grows steadily. And that's where we're coming in with the see and learn. We want to build on that vocabulary. Grammar is difficult. Grammar is difficult to work on anyways. I find it's a difficult one to remediate, but you need a lot of vocabulary for grammar to develop. So we, before we even touch grammar, 
we need to make sure there's enough vocabulary there. So we have to build up the vocabulary system. And that's why we use something like the C and Learn. Now, the C and Learn isn't the be all and the end all. You can use other vocabulary programs, absolutely. Um, but the goal is to build up vocabulary. And with the speech intelligibility, we're constantly striving to make the um, target sound as clear as possible. Again, by looking at other factors such as hearing, um, we look at, at that in, in depth. We need to be very mindful of, uh, of the uh, hearing and um, any support you can get from audiology, please take it. So again, we're back to vocabulary development. There is a really, really important link between our vocabulary size and the development of our spoken grammar, our expressive grammar. And some of the delay or the grammar delay seen in children with Down syndrome is linked with the delay in learning vocab. So the sooner we learn our vocabulary, the grammar will follow. But in order to have a sentence like the boy is running, we need at least at least 250 words to create a sentence like that. And that's a very basic sentence. So when we're working on grammar, we have to make sure there is a significant amount of vocabulary there. So this brings us on to the C and Learn and what is the C and Learn all about? So it's an easy to use teaching program. It's a resource and it is a program also, but I use it as a resource in conjunction with so many other materials as well. Um, it is a very quick and simple and easy way to bring on speech, language, and also to start some early reading. But I just want to put a caveat here where early reading is only being used to develop language. So if you have a child who has one to two word sentences and you really want to build that up to two to three word sentences, we would use this reading um, resource to do that. And I'll explain why in a minute. I do use their number program called First Counting to reinforce matching. I go from one to five and um, then I leave the rest to Maths for Life or Numicon. But it's a nice way of reinforcing matching, getting the kids to look at numerals. It's very simple and easy to use. I do enjoy it. Memory, I just bring in Gather Cole's kind of um, theoretical approach. Gather Cole has written an awful lot on working memory. And um, I don't tend to use the CNR memory program. I try to incorporate a lot of uh, repetition um, into my everyday practice with the children and, and, and get parents to do something every day, repeat things every day. And having a resource like the CNR facilitates that. So what does it look like and what are all these packs about? So I'm always getting emails or phone calls about, oh, what pack, what pack, what pack? So if you're working with a child and you're not working with me or the children aren't attending monthly groups or anything like that, go to your local SLT and get them to have a look at the vocabulary, their knowledge, their expressive language. And then uh, you will see here at the end of this um, presentation when you should be using what particular pack. So if your child has 10 words, couple of sounds, you would start with the speech sound kit and you would start with vocabulary one, but I'll explain it more in, in a little while. So you have a speech sound kit. And if, if somebody said to me, if you had to pick one kit, Olive, that you'd pick over everything else, what would the kit be? It would be the speech sound kit because you can use that across the lifespan. You know, adults with Down syndrome often come back to speech therapy to tidy up some speech sounds, or they might be going for an interview and they'd say, you know, I want to sound my best at the interview. Um, I've had some decrease in my hearing. I think it's affected my speech production. I want to sort out some sounds. Um, it could be working in primary school where a child is needs to focus on maybe improving their S or their F sound. You would do this in conjunction with your SLT. If you're working very much alone, you would follow the guidelines in the instruction books. There are instruction books in the packs. This always seems like a revelation when I say this. You know, there is an instruction pack. You could follow that as well. Um, but I just, I just, I just. So the speech sound pack for me is the one that I would, I bring it to clinic all the time. I'd have it on me all the time because you are, you can always use it. It's brilliant. I find it great. Then you have um, a pack where you're combining sounds. So once your child learns how to say all the individual sounds, then they can move on to actually putting consonants and vowels together. It's quite a very 
specific resource and it just works on the first string, that first phase of speech sound acquisition. And then you have saying words one to three where every um, sound is given a CVC, a consonant vowel, consonant word, and you practice those. And it goes all the way through the speech sounds um, that a child would have by the age of four or five. Then the language kits, these are the nouns and verbs for vocabulary. These are building up your vocabulary. So vocabulary kit one has 50 words, 48 to be more precise, um, 40 nouns and eight verbs. And then vocabulary two has 60 and vocabulary three has about 60 words as well, nouns and verbs. So you're building up that vocabulary system. And then you see phrases one to three is that reading, um, those reading books and, and sight words that I was alluding to earlier on you would use this um, from when the child is about 50 words. So they're the kits, these kits. Now you might go on to the website, Down Syndrome Education International, and you'll see all these packs that cost a lot of money. You really just want to look and see what one kit do I need? Is it for vocabulary? Is it for speech? Do I want to work on language through reading? And you just pick one kit that suits you or oftentimes for children who have limited vocabulary and limited speech sounds, we often suggest you start with the speech sound kit or vocabulary one or the two together. I'd often combine the two. So the first kit that I talked about was the speech, see and learn speech sounds. And we start at using this at six months. I cannot tell you the joy it brings me to start showing cards to little ones who are sitting there propped up on their mom or dad's lap and we start introducing the sounds. This is to start off listening to sounds, listening to those. Remember those on the banner, what the child has at age two, what the child has at age three, what the child has at age four. We start putting in those sounds in that very sequence, in sets, set one corresponding to that age two, set two corresponding to age three and set four corresponding to age, or set three, I mean, corresponding to age four. This allows um, children to hear the difference between their sounds. And then once they can hear the difference, we can work on producing the sounds. You can use this with older children. There is no cap on this. Um, obviously you would be guided by your speech and language therapist, but if you're working in isolation, you don't know where to start. Your ch the child has a limited speech sound inventory, this is a good one to start with. Again, it's going to be quick. You use it once a day. You use it for no more than five to 10 minutes. It's done, but you repeat the usage of it, remembering that auditory memory. So it goes through listening to sounds. You're holding up a card. You say the sound five times and you get the child to look at the card, then your mouth, the card, then your mouth, then the card, then your mouth. And you move through this. You move through the sets. You rotate them um through three sessions so you do it three sets of cards cards and you just run through it so that's a quick and easy way of doing it and that's what they look like r r r r r sometimes they cue the sound in with the sign i'm too fast and so on and so forth and you would work through that first set and introduce it as we said through to your three sessions and then when you finish introducing the sounds, inputting in the sounds, we then start to listen to different sounds. Now, this is where it, it, you have to invest a bit of patience and time. And you, once you've done all of that, you've inputted in all of those sets of sounds, you see here that you place them. Well, I just hold them in front of me and say the sound, ba 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 ta 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 and then I say b. And then I get them to to say the sound or get them to to point or I look at the sound. Um, for the older children, you can introduce this at tabletop activity and you can be uh, you can set the goals. You can change. You can step it up, step it down as is needed. Um, you practice the first set of sound pairs for 20 sessions before moving on to the later set of sound pairs. Um, so you work on these for 20 sessions. So you're putting a lot of work in this time for discrimination. So 20 sessions for the set, first set of sounds and then moving on to the next set of sounds, you're spending another 20 sessions. So if you're based in a school, that could bring you through a whole term um, of doing that. It's, it's quite a significant amount of time, but it's well worth it. Sometimes we get it done in 20 sessions. 
sessions. It depends on the child, but do dedicate a period of time for this discrimination discrimination of sounds. Um, when we're saying the sounds, once we can discriminate the sounds, then we get the child to say the sound. So even with the, the little ones, we do, if we have input in ba 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 da da da, we hold up the cards and then I'll say the word d, and then I wait and see can they imitate. And oftentimes they will. And that's heaven. For the older children, you're working on that sound. If you're doing something like and they give you back d, then you'd say, yeah. You keep modeling the sound. That would be something as well to make sure, again, that the hearing has been checked. Um, and if there is a hearing issue, that they have something to support their hearing, either a speech sound system in the classroom or they're wearing a Baja or they have their um, hearing aids. Now, once your child can produce some of those individual sounds, we can move on to combining the sounds, as I said before. You see those cards there? We have ba, e, you put the ba and the e together and you get b, b, e, b, e, b. So they're practicing the individual phonemes and then the sounds, and then they go and they combine them. So that's very, very useful. Sh, u, sh, u, shu. And it's a great way to help them blend the consonant and vowel, because oftentimes that can be quite difficult. So when do you use it? As I said there, when you have at least some of the consonants, pa, ba, ma, ha, k, la, er, sh, t, w, z. And if they can have, um, if they can say some of the vowels, e comes easily to children and u comes easily. Ah, ah, as an ant is great. R is used um, in the UK quite frequently for bar, for ba. Um, they use the AR differently than we do. So just sometimes I um, put in ba for ba. Um, it's a little bit different. So as you hear this, children will learn to say sounds in different orders. Um, you can work on different sound combinations. A lot of smallies can do a lot of this. Shh. Um, and then you could start combining the consonants. It just depends, but it's a really good one to, to work on. And again, there you can see that see and learn combining sounds may also be useful for older children who are making word attempts but have very unclear speech. So for somebody, again, who's working in isolation, a teacher maybe or an early years educator who'd really like to support the child's speech and language, doesn't really want to do any harm, uh, that's a really useful one to do as well. You're not going to do any harm, so you can, you can work on that. Once the child has good speech combinations, you can see that here, it can produce at least some of their consonants, but, but, um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, or ha, uh, um, and they can produce some kind of um, combination like mu or ba or shu. You can then start working on practicing words. Um, so it would be things like bed, baby, ball, boat, bag. Um, door, deer, duck, pizza, pea, paint, um, horse, head, hood, and you can see all of them there, mouse, moon, man, all of those words. And you would practice them. You will repeat them over and over again. And again, these can be pulled out all the way through the primary school cycle or into the post-primary school cycle and working on increasing intelligibility of speech because you're getting repeated practice at this. It's over and over again but it's for a limited time once a day, and then it's done. Then you can consolidate the words in everyday practice in, in the school setting or the preschool setting, home setting, wherever it is. Um, you'll see here saying words one focuses on the first phase of acquisition. Do you remember the sounds that they get at about age two, then age three? Do you remember the sounds that they had? The ch, f, g, r, t, and v. Sorry, I'm just producing the phonemes, but they're the sounds that we'd be working on. And then the very last pack would have sounds um, like um, shoe, thistle, um, sun, zoo, uh, lolly, um, and jug, those kind of sounds. Before we start anything, really, we have to make sure we have a baseline. So we check how many words the child actually can say, sign, imitate, words that are familiar to um, family members and to unfamiliar listeners. So if a child is going into a new setting, would the person be able to understand them? And parents complete these forms, and then we tally how many words they can produce, how many words they understand, and that allows us then to also identify which pack is appropriate for them. 
So if the child has less than 20 words, you know, we use this first 120 words then to document how many they gain. And if they are, you know, if they have a fairly sizable vocab um, and we want to build it up, we look at the second checklist and we're looking at things like adjectives and, and building that up, adjectives and modifiers and um, maybe some grammatical elements, past tense, things like that. But these, I'll, I'll attach these to the email that I'll forward to you. Okay, so the see and learn then for vocabulary. Remember, speech sounds are there to make speech clearer, to communicate a message in a clear way. Our vocabulary is there because we need nouns and verbs. We need vocabulary as well for grammatical elements. Gr grammar makes everything a little bit easier to understand. If we don't have a lot of grammar, we're quite telegraphic in the way, or like it's like a telegram, telegrammatic speech, which is absolutely fine as well. Many adults with Down syndrome work older students use that kind of telegrammatic speech, communicate absolutely fine, get their message across, no problem. But sometimes, um, it, you know, as um, the students get older, they, they do say, I'd like to work on my talking, I'd like to work on my communication and make it the best it can be. So by increasing that vocab, we can improve our grammar. If you have a child that has only got about 10 words, you know, you wouldn't be working on grammar. So just be aware of that. You're working on vocab development very early on. So when do you start working on this vocabulary development? Usually the guideline is about 18 months. I start a little bit earlier. If the child is keen on books, if they're pointing, if they can match objects, and so many of the children that I work with are well able to do that. You know, but some of the children might have had a delayed start with hospitalizations, like a lot of sickness, um, they may not be ready to start until they are around 18 months. There's nothing to stop you. These are, as Professor Sue Buckley said to me the other day, these are all guidelines. Go with your gut and watch what the child is doing and follow the child's lead. So we work on the principle as well of errorless learning. In my eyes, children with Down syndrome can do no wrong and they shouldn't be made to feel like they're doing anything wrong when they're working in a clinic, in a school. Um, if they're working on a particular task, we work on the on the basis that everything should be set up for success because Yoder in 2014 produced um, a paper where he found that um, or it was found that um, individuals with Down syndrome more than any other cohort of individuals with additional needs um, really felt failure so keenly that it was preventing them from moving forward educationally or in life itself for fear of failure and imagine um that fear prevent you know a failure preventing you from trying something new so we work on um everything being set up for success we manipulate the situation that everything is correct and because we do that and we're doing it through repetition remember we do everything over and over again it becomes naturally uh, the child actually learns it naturally and it becomes a consolidated um, activity or task. So we don't use no a lot. You know, if you hold up a card and say, what's this? And if the child, if the target word is cat and the child says dog, you know, you're going to say, oh, I forgot. Sorry, I held up the wrong card. This is all. Oh, did I show you the wrong one? Oh, it's my fault. It should have been cat. Oh, I'm so sorry. Whatever you were doing. So um, that's what we're working on. How do we introduce vocabulary? We work in a very procedural way. We get the child to look at four cards at a time. So we work on four cards at a time. And those four cards that you pick are the ones that you work on until they name them. So we get them to look at the cards. We get them to match the cards. We get them to select the cards. And then we get them to name them. So what we do is with our four cards that we pick, we get them to look at them. So we hold them up and say, cat, cat, cat. And then they look at your mouth and the card. And then dog, 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 mommy, 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 daddy, daddy, daddy. After they can look, you know, if they look independently at the card and at your mouth repeatedly, you move on to the next task with the same four cards and you get them to match pictures. Now, this can be a difficult task for children who hate matching. They may not want to do it. They may not like to do it. You can skip this stage if it's not working out. Again, Professor Sue Buckley said this is a guideline. You do not stick with this rigidly until they 
until they get it. Use your clinical intuition, your, your, your teacher skill, your parental intuition, move on if it's not working. We generally, what I do is I would show the card, bag, cam, hold it up, then hand the child the card and manipulate my cards towards theirs. I sometimes put them on the ground. I get the child to, to find the, the, the matching card. If it is a struggle and people are becoming frustrated and you've worked on a, on a little bit and you've said the words over and over again, you can move on to the next section. This is where this resource can often fail if you stick to each level until they achieve it. Like everything in life, this might suit them. Some kids get the matching like that. Other children find that one more difficult. I get so many parents saying, look, when it comes to the matching, it's so hit and miss off. You know, we kind of put away the cards because we're all sick of it. At that point, I just want to say, move on, move on. It doesn't matter, move on to the next stage. Because you've been talking about these words so much, you've been looking at the cards and through the matching process, be it successful or not, you've been saying the words. So now what we want to do is basically we want to see can they comprehend them can they understand the spoken word so if you're holding up cow and bag and you say oh cow and they eye point to it you know they understand it if they tap it grab it whatever they do i accept any of those it just shows that they understand that that's a cow that had that picture has a word representation so that's really important. And what that means is if you understand what you're looking at, then you can go on to say the word. So then once we know that they understand those four cards that we have been working on solidly from looking, matching to selecting, now we go on to say the word. So you show them a picture of the bag, you ask them to name it. What's that? And... um you wait and see can they say it if they don't say it after a period of time you just say it three times bag 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 with the biggest smile on your face you know no problem there's no problem at all if they make a sound like ah or ma or ag you say oh my gosh i can't believe you just said bag like that that's amazing you're amazing Obviously, you would check your tone and, and change it for the age group you're working on. I don't think a fifth class student would be too appreciative of that. But you could say, do you know what? Amazing. Perfect. Lovely. Bag, bag, bag. You said bag. How wonderful are you? You said bag. Now, please note how many times I've repeated that word. I aim to repeat the words over and over again for the duration of the time that I'm working with the child. Did you see my bag? My bag is on the floor. I like your bag. That's the bag. Oh, the green bag. Do you have a green bag for shopping with mommy? Oh, that bag is lovely. Whatever way you are, or whatever age group you're working in, you tend to repeat it as often as you can. So once you have established, sorry, go back. Once you've done your first four cards, then you pick the next four cards in that pack in vocabulary one and the next four and you keep working until you have your 48 words. They can be spoken, signed, verbalized or vocalized. But you will know when you go to your speech and language therapist or your CDNT or into primary care that when you come to set joint goals, you can say, listen, my little Zoe understands 50 words or my little Tom understands 35 words. I'd like to move up to understanding 50 and I'd like the production of 20 to 30 building to 50 words. So and I'd like to do it using a resource such as the C and Learn or whatever vocab resource that they use. It doesn't matter, but you need to be very consistent in the repetition uh, of the words, like the sounds that we we're talking before. Remember, there was 20 sessions spent on working on sound discrimination. So we do need to spend time inputting um, the words. So you're going to get through this. Some people move very swiftly through the packs. Other people take their time. And again, some people can have issues because there can be illness, um, some hospital stays, holidays. We all forget to bring our homework on holidays. Why would we be bringing homework on holidays? There can be reasons, you know, for, for gaps. But please try to be consistent with it, though, if you can be. So the first vocabulary, too. So say you're working with a child and you have your checklist. And you go down to the checklist and the child is about 60 words. And you think, oh my 
goodness, I would love to increase that. I would love to get to 120 or whatever it is. Um, I really want to build up their vocabulary. Then you would introduce vocabulary too. Again, you are building, building, building. And sometimes when we, you know, when I talk about the first 50 words, some people say, but there's only 48 cards in it. You will instinctively use words like look, again, more, the favorite one of all Irish mammies, now, now, now. Um, everyone knows that word in Ireland, now. Um, next, or again, whatever it is, you're adding those ones on that are just learned intrinsically um, during the tasks. And again, with these um, 52 pairs of picture cards, you're introducing more um, words as you're doing them. Um, finish, um, let's go, whatever it might be. And these are more um, high, they are high frequency words, but they are, you know, nice words, splashing, boot, teeth, tummy. Um, you're building up a nice vocabulary here as well. So this is a great way to build your vocabulary. And in your head, what is your goal? You're building vocabulary to improve grammatical um, structures or the introduction of grammar, but you're also giving enough language for a child to produce two to three word phrases. So at 50 words, we have two to three word phrases. At about 250 words, we have three word phrases that have some component of grammar. So the ING, that's the very first thing you acquire when you're learning grammar. If there are any SLTs here, you're probably suffering from um, remembering your morphology uh, modules where we learned about grammar and the, the Brown's morphemes, 14 different levels that you have to learn of acquisition of grammar. So exciting. But anyway, the first one you achieve is called a present progressive, and that is the ING, running walking um and so you need your vocab for that to appear so again once you have your 120 words you're going to build up more and more and more and there it gives you a, a guideline if you've completed your checklist and your child understands between 80 to 120 words you can introduce this this will increase and help you expand the vocabulary words like tractor swimming in prepositions are in that adjectives dirty clean hot cold all of those things um, and then it's building up the range of vocabulary also you're really starting to look at concepts adjectives, modifiers, all of those things. So that's a nice one as well, because it's just, it's, it's giving you a kind of a complexity with the vocab as well. So when you have built up all of this vocabulary or you're working on one specific pack, say for example, the see and learn phrases one, where you have 48 words, but you should acquire about 50-ish because you're using incidental language, you can actually then with even vocabulary one, start with the readers. And this is where I, I'm working with a little girl who is in junior infants. And she has really had this huge spurt in her vocabulary. And we are working on, um, I suppose, lengthening phrases using these, this resource, the first phrase is one. And she completed her first book, all of the, oh, she can read part, like phrases independently now. She's very adept at using this. And the confidence that she has, the swagger that she has when she's doing it is absolutely fantastic. I would love to name her and give her kudos, but I know I can't. But if anybody knows who it is out there, if there's a teacher on supporting her, she's absolutely amazing. So when to start using this first phrases um, pack. So remember, this is a pack that contains eight books. Each of those books is related to the verb that you would have worked on in your first vocabulary. So words like eating, drinking, sitting, crying, uh, whose ball, um, all of those words are related, absolutely related to the vocabulary you did in vocab one. Nothing new will come up. They know all the words because you have drilled them in by that continuous repetition. And repetition is key to support the working memory. So you're a teacher, you're an early years educator, you're a mom, you're a dad, you're here deciding what will we start with? And you're going to complete your checklist and you figure out that your child understands at least 50 words. 
including nouns and verbs and prepetitions, maybe nouns like baby, ball, bear, bed, action words like brushing, drinking, um, sitting, sleeping, and, you know, um, a preposition like on or in. They can say or sign some of the words. They can say or sign some of them. But the big thing is, is that they can follow two part commands like wash dolly, rub face, wash hair, those kind of things. Um, and they should have completed vocabulary one. You should know that they know those. And you will know they understand 50 words as well because you will have done the selection of the words. So you can, you can do a quick review of that if you so wish. So see and learn phrases one can start early. A lot of the preschoolers start it with me. Love it. It's amazing when they start because what you do with this is you pick your very first book. We always start with who is eating. I generally sign, sorry, love, I sign as I read this book just to give them extra support. And so it goes, who is eating? We turn the page, doll is eating, baby is eating, dog is eating, cat is eating, um, and so on and so forth. So there, it isn't a lot to learn. When you read along, the child read alongs with, read reads along with you I'm not a teacher so I don't ever pretend to be teaching reading we are literally inputting in those phrases when you start doing this you will find that the child will either say the noun or they'll say the verb as you're reading it so if you go if you're reading together you'll say uh, doll is and the child will go eating or eating or sometimes they'll get in and they'll say, you, you know, you turn the page, you'll wait, obviously, for them to initiate. And then they'll hear doll and then there'll be a pause. And then you might have to come in and say, is eating. You shouldn't expect the child at the beginning of this activity to be able to say that full phrase. Remember, who is eating is quite a significant length of phrase. So we need to work on building that up. And, they, you know, the goal is to put two to three words together. So, you know, at the start, we shouldn't have any expectations like that. That's the ultimate goal at the end of completing this task. So first of all, we read the book. We read the book at the start of our activity and at the end of the activity. So the reader is always the opener of the activity. The book is always the opener. It's a nice thing to do. You're introducing them to the vocabulary before you do the specific task. And the first specific task you'll do is matching sight words. It seems like a huge leap, but I promise you it's not. Remember, we, it's, it's all of this is based in theory and the theory that children from about two and a half recognize the printed word. We are taking that learning profile and we are maximizing that skill by having the children match, you know, car with car, drinking with drinking, eating with eating, dog with dog. And it really is, and it never ceases to amaze me how quickly and how adept the children are at matching. Never ceases to amaze me. And I always look at the parents and they always say, I'd say that's a fluke. Okay, maybe sometimes it is, but more often than not, it is a genuine match because they can see the similarities. You're working on that visual skill that they have, which is phenomenal. So we match the sight words. After you've gone through dog, doll, cat, baby, uh, dog, then and eating, then you, and once they've matched all the combinations, you then read the book again and you forget about the activity for the day. You do it once a day done and when they become really good at matching so you know that they're independently matching without any um cues or supports you move on to the next stage so first of all they're literally using their visual memory to match sight words that's it there's no literacy involved and again literacy is more reading and language intervention this is just trying to support language if you have a child with a limited um language inventory so after you match your sight words, guess what? We go on to see, do they remember? Do they understand? Can they link the spoken words with the correct written word? So you'll hold up cat. Sorry, you read the book again first. And then you hold up the words just related to the book. So this eating dog, dog, cat, one of those, baby. So you'd hold up baby and eating, baby eating. And then you'll say, show baby. And if they look, 
they have it, if they grab it, they have it, if they point to it, if they tap it, whatever. And that means that they understand the sight word. That means um, that things are moving in the right direction. They're using their visual memory. They're remembering that that word relates to a written, that, sound, that, that spoken word is related to a written word. Fantastic. Happy days. And then as you finish this, when you go through all of your cards, you read your book again, you move on to the next phase once they're independently doing it. Now, this is something that can cause problems, this section. You then are relying on the child's visual memory to, to say the word. Now, from three in the research, we should be doing phonics along with our children. We should be working on phonics, phonics, phonics. They should be exposed to phonics. We should be using phonics. So this is where it can get a little bit difficult because the phonics is all around and so it should be. So sometimes when the children are shown words to read, they're working off their visual memory, but you see phonics coming in. So say, for example, they have the word um, bear and bear is eating. So bear and you hold up bear, you see baby. Uh, sometimes that can happen. And then you'd say, oh, bear, bear, bear. Oh, yeah, the bear, the bear. Um, other times children cannot remember the word. And this is where a lot of teachers and early edu uh, early earth educators really feel that this gets really tricky and that it can be deflating for everyone, no matter how much you're using errorless learning. Again, I went back with all of your questions that have come up before. And I said to Professor Buckley, look, if the reading words doesn't work out, but we know the child understands it, can we please move on because it's causing problems? Of course you can. Please move on. If they get 50% of them, fantastic. Don't let this um, cause you problems. We'll, it'll improve as you go. And I promise you that because uh, one of the, the, that little girl that I was talking about initially found, you know, that is now absolutely, you know, just she's going to be moving on to reading and language intervention and she's going to be on to her school readers very shortly. Um, she struggled with the visual memory of the of reading those sight words, but then we moved on quite quickly because we didn't want her to feel any difficulties. And we wanted to check then, could she understand the sight words? Now we're moving in slightly to the realm of literacy here because we want to test if the child understands the words that they can read, that they really have an understanding of that, that they have a semantic representation, an orthographic representation, of the words that they're reading. So you show the child the picture cards of dog and bear, and then you give them the word bear, for example, and you get them to put bear with bear. So I would give the, I'd give the spoken cue, put bear with bear. Basically, I'm like hovering the card over, put bear with bear, bear with bear. Um, and then we start from that, that point of success, and then the child independently does it. They get, to, they get very quick at this. And once we know that they can understand the sight word, it just opens up a realm for them because they now have a greater understanding of the word. They understand that you can apply that word dog to all kinds of dogs, just not the one in the picture. They, they, they can begin to generalize the use of it. Then we move on to understanding phrases. And here we test the child's understanding of those phrases that they have been reading with you at the beginning of every task, like dog is eating. Then we move on to check, do they actually understand what it is? Are they just listening to Ollie? Have they just learned off the book? We want to see, do they really understand those phrases? So again, you show them the picture cards, dog is eating, bear is eating. You give them a phrase card, which will have nothing on it except the written words. And you ask them to match the phrase to the picture. And when they do, just think about the biggest cheer ever. You feel like a ticker tape, a tape parade has gone off in your head. And you're like, yes, this, this is fantastic. Because what that means is you can take it to higher levels then and you can step it up. You can just take away the picture cards and see, can they select between the phrases? Can they read the phrases independently? It just opens up um, a whole avenue for you. The whole goal then is to hand them the, the book and then they read it independently. And then ultimately, because they've read it so much then and they've worked on all of this, you should see a consolidation or a generalization of their production of two to three word phrases. So it's, a, it's, so, it's so lovely. You know, when you get to that level, it is lovely. 
Um, and on you go then to phrases two and phrases three. There are 24 books altogether that you can work on. And you work along the vocabulary you're building up. And then you see the grammar developing and you see the length of the phrase developing. Again, we're not here doing um, phonic blends or anything like that, because the hope is that that would be being done independently and in school and they'd be exposed to jolly phonics at home or phonics, whatever program it is you're working on. And that by the time you, your child is, you know, you know, exposed to phonics, that they should be able to blend them. Now, children with a significant speech and language delay can find reading difficult. I, you know, so having the sight word approach can be useful too. But please, please, please look at the primary school, the reading and language intervention program. But for those kids that don't have a lot of language, this is the one to start with. So what do you need to remember? You need to follow the child's lead. No matter where they go, you follow them. If you're sitting under the table doing the cards, so be it. If you're sitting on the steps of the stairs before they go to bed, and that's the only time you can do it, grand. Lying on the counter in the kitchen, I've seen it all. It doesn't matter. If you're down in your resource room and they want to sit in a beanbag doing it, grand. Not a problem. You don't make it a problem. Promote success. Because it's only for five to 10 minutes. It's not long. And then it's done, put away, and on you go. Everything in a child's life, everything a child with Down syndrome works on, be it coloring, um, cutting, talking, whatever it is, everything should be celebrated. Oh my gosh, you're, oh, you're just wonderful. Oh, you're amazing. I have to ring mommy and tell her you're amazing. Or can't believe you did that. You are fantastic. If it's an adult, look, you're just like blown away. I'm so proud to be working with you. You are amazing. And it, it's just great. It is just great. When you can promote that success, it just brings on more. Keep your language simple. Two words in, yields two words out. You know, keep it simple. It doesn't have to be in my voice, which is quite um, attuned to the younger children. Um, keep it simple, but it doesn't have to be infantilizing. You know, you can work with adults or older students in the primary school cycle and you can keep your language simple, but age appropriate as well sign 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 if you're introducing a new task and you need to promote comprehension can you wait wait i need to show you a new book that we're going to work on thanks a million your sir keep your records try and uh, and um keep up to date with how many new words you hear or if they produce a sentence um a spontaneous sentence documented because it's always fantastic or tell the therapist if you're at home and you hear the sentence, go and tell the therapist, tell the teacher, or if the teacher hears it, something being said in school, like, where's that? Um, somebody said, uh, what is it? And the teacher um, sent in a message to me via mom. I was thrilled um, because we've been working on expansion of sentences for ages. And I know this can be a learned phrase, but it was brilliant to hear it. Um, organize your sessions, locations. I know in school it can be difficult to find a quiet section or area. If the child is accessing resource, you know, there should be a room. If you are working in a group setting, the efficacy shows that these, I'm working in groups all the time. I'm doing seal learn groups everywhere. And I find them great because you have turn taking built in. You've got a child waiting. They're hearing something being repeated over and over again. They get multiple repetitions of it. Um, they're learning to wait and they are also, you know, learning to respect other people's time. Um, Groups can work. Individual sessions are obviously great as well. If a child has issues with hearing, uh, if there's if there's a lot of environmental sound, it can impact it. The timing, no more than five to 10 minutes. If the speech sounds are done in a jiffy, they are so fast. Um, the duration, you know that, um, oh, sorry, the time you should be either morning or evening, sorry. Um, the duration, no more than 10 minutes and the frequency every day if possible at a minimum five times a week because you're doing it for repetition for the working memory so here i've given you when you should use it so scooch on down to the end of this presentation if you want to start tomorrow you can um you know you can go to your down syndrome branches you can borrow these in galway there are seven libraries with all of these resources in them if you are uh, if you want further information about how to access them from the library contact down syndrome galway if you're in that area um in donegal there are down syndrome packs in bondoran and letter kenny dunleary have them wexford have them 
um, Down syndrome Limerick have an extensive library of them as well. And um, so everywhere is building up, at least in most branches, they have access to one or two. More and more branches are building up um, their packs. The libraries are really becoming interested in supporting this. I had such a lovely experience in Donegal recently where two of the librarians attended the training um, and were just advocating borrowing this and coming to get this from them. Um, so if you're in Leitrim, kind of on the border there, Leitrim Sligo, the Bundoran Library has loads of them. Um, so yes, so just look, talk to your local branch and then see um, from there if they are in local libraries as well. Um, you can also buy them from Down Syndrome Education International. That's the only place you can purchase them from or you can borrow them, as I said, from your library, your local library, just check, or your um, Down syndrome branch. Um, and if you're a teacher, you can access them through the parent. Um, okay, so it just tells you where to, what to start with. So if you if you have very limited amount of vocab, you will start with vocabulary one. If you have, um, there you see, if you want to go to vocabulary two, a child who understands 50 to 60 words, since they are assigned 10 more, you can go on to that and vocabulary three and building up. It's not always the case of getting the words out. It can be understanding as well and building up that understanding. Um, and then it tells you when to start your phrases. Also, it's all there. This is um, a link to the Pediatric Speech and Language Therapist Toolkit for those working with children, students with Down syndrome. I love it. It's done in a hierarchy and it tells you when you should be doing particular resources, what resources you should be doing. There is a speech and language um, uh, information. There's some speech and language therapy in information there about when to um, intervene or when you should start or how much therapy or dosage of therapy a child should be getting. I'm going to attach also something that's not in this webinar and it is, um, the, um, the information, the most evidence-based, research-based um, interventions we should be doing, the times we should be intervening with um, adults, post-primary students, um, primary students and children with Down syndrome and babies. And it highlights all the areas that need intervention and need support from audiology, communication, um, across the board. It's all there, literacy, everything. And I'm just going to attach that also because it can be quite useful as an advocacy tool um, for you as therapists if you're here tonight as a clinician, for uh, if you're bringing it to management, it can be for a parent if you're advocate uh, if you're involved in trying to get more therapy, and it also it's it's just a general advice sheet. It's very useful, and um, so please it's it's current, it's up to date, and I I will be sending it out to as many people as I possibly can. So don't ever give up. Be like those strong gladiators there in Rome who went out and if they couldn't win or get to the, the ultimate goal, be very brave in the attempt um, and keep going. And I hope this uh, webinar was of use to you. Um, this is the last webinar on CNLearn for this year. I'll start again in September for the next academic year. This um, has been recorded, so I will send you the recording. I will put it up on the website as well so that you will be able to access it. Are there any questions? I'm gonna stop the recording if there's any questions. I can't see the questions all of a sudden, sorry. No, and I'm time over and I went eight minutes over. So apologies. So there we will leave it. Uh, thank you so much again for attending tonight. And um, I hope our paths cross in the future. Take care for now. Thank you so much. Bye.